Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Scrubbed In Show. I hope you've all been keeping well. This week we have with us another incredible guest. We have with us Dr. Grant Lewis, who we just discovered is the inventor of virtual wards, a consultant in public health and the director of population health at Microsoft. So it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show today, Grant. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. So we were kind of snooping around, having a look at your career, all the wonderful things you've done. And it's gone from kind of clinical medicine, advisory, data, now more big tech. Um, And of course, virtual wards, which has kind of been a buzzword recently. But before we kind of talk about that, we really want to take it back. Kind of, you know, Garan, you know, embarking on this journey to study medicine, to become a doctor. Tell us the motivations, you know, and bring us up to speed. Sure. So actually, I originally thought I was going to go and study physics uh, and apply oh, to wow. university to, to read physics. But I remember being kind of um, having my leg pulled by friends of mine that were going to study medicine, saying, oh, you're just going to be sort of a lonely old man stuck in a laboratory. <laughs> Why don't you do medicine, which is a much more sociable, you know, human kind of thing to do. So I actually took a gap year um, Funnily enough, I went, I went to France to study music for a, for a year, got that out of my system, um, yeah. and then came back and, and, and read medicine. So I guess it was, uh, I always knew I wanted to do something scientific, but I think it was that human element and the human interaction being part of a, a multidisciplinary team was what kind of spurred me into, into applying to read medicine, yeah. No, definitely. So you said something that was a bit odd, and I don't know. So you tend to have the creatives of the world, the musician, the artist, and then you have the scientists, the physics, you know, straight off the bat, you are just combining it. Like, how would you describe yourself? Are you kind of a technologist, a, you know, a scientist, a creative? I know it's a tricky question, but... Uh, I guess I'm a jack of all trades in many ways. Um, I, I think all of us that go into medicine need to be both scientists and artists. Um, you yeah. know, I've kind of inherited mm. that from my... My mum was a, a chemistry teacher, so on the scientific side. My dad's um, kind of a, a lawyer, so was studying in the arts. So I, I think we've all got a bit of that. Um, yeah. But yes, my my career has sort of drifted around, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk our way For through sure. it. But w- one of the attractions, I guess, is as medicine became very kind of evidence-based early on in my career and, and very kind of protocolized. So the the opportunity to be more creative in clinical practice was quite rightly kind of constrained. And, and so I think I found an outlet initially in public yeah. health medicine where you do get a chance to stay, take a step back and, and, and be involved in, in more creative kind of projects. Yeah. No, definitely. And, and I do agree that there is a creative within all of us, especially when it comes to, to clinical medicine. Tell us about kind of finally becoming a clinician. I know you did a stint at GSTT where we trained as well. Um, How was it in terms of initial wanting to do physics, had this creative, got through med school, and now you're kind of on the hospital, on the wards, fully fledged doctor? Yeah. So I really, um, really enjoyed clinical school. I made many really you know, lifelong friends that I'm still in in touch with, Um, but then moved into kind of clinical practice and looking back now that we're talking about it today, I've not really thought of this before, but (laughs) I wasn't terribly happy. It's quite, um, you know, we we all know just how brutal clinical medicine can be. I did my first house jobs in, like like many people, in the hospitals where they trained. And Mm. there is that slight infantilization because they knew you as an undergraduate, they don't then, you know, many, many people don't make that switch to saying, actually, I'm now mm. a colleague. Um, and yeah. so I felt that was slightly condescending quite often to be um, in, in that environment. Um, did my house jobs, came down to London because um, I trained in Cambridge, but came down to London to do A&E. And I'm really glad I did that. Um, you know, in, in your training, you're always what, what they're teaching you in many cases is how to spot emergencies, how to deal with emergencies. Yeah. You don't really get to do that until you're in A&E. So did A&E and, and in fact carried on in the same A&E department doing locum shifts for a full um, decade after that. I re- really was happy there. Um, mm. But then moved into my next job was cardiology because doing a and I was always petrified about <laughs> kind of reading ECGs and stuff. So I thought, <laughs> right, I've got to go do a cardiology job. So went to London Chest uh, Hospital to do that, which was a bit of a baptism by fire for various reasons when when 
because you were literally the only there were only two doctors in the entire hospital so it was, it was quite scary but um there was very much a presumption if you if you did that job that you then needed to start studying for the MRCP exams and quite quickly I found myself on this conveyor belt to doing the MRCP mm. exams without really taking a step back and thinking where's my career going so mm. kept, kept going through the training did some brilliant jobs worked at the Whittington Hospital which is probably the friendliest hospital I ever worked in and again I've got lifelong friends from there as you said came down to St Thomas's then to do high dependency medicine but haven't really found um, a specialty that really gelled with me. So many of my mm. friends, you know, they might do a nephrology job and write renal is the be all and end all. That's, that they mm. found that kind of niche. I never really felt that other than knowing that none of them were quite right. So decided to take a bit of time out, went down to Australia, did A&E down there. And I had one of those moments in life, which I know a lot of people sometimes talk about. Mine came at about 3.15 one Sunday morning, oh. where I <laughs> suddenly thought, oh my God, do I really want to be doing this for the rest of my <laughs> career? And you know, back then, Australia and uh, A&E as a specialty was much more established than it was in the UK. Um, mm. And uh, their, their consultants were in pretty much every other weekend. And I was thinking, do I really want to be you know, working every single weekend? And I found myself really interested by the Australian healthcare system uh, mm. and, and found myself more interested in the system really than any in individual patient. So it was at that moment, I, as I said, I had that kind of light bulb uh, thing and decided actually, do you know what, I'm going to not pursue a, 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 a career in clinical medicine. I'm going to explore, you know, branching away from, from it. And the easiest thing to do was public health because um, it felt like it was one step away from clinical medicine without abandoning everything. So I came yeah. back to the UK, uh, did a registrar job in A&E, this time at the Royal Free Hospital. But during my time there, I applied for um, for a public health training number and was successful and, and, and got that. Hmm, definitely. One question I wanted to ask, and I know a lot of people will probably want a bit more lights on it is, public health, what does it actually mean? What does it entail? Because you always hear about it. You never really get taught about it in med school um, and you don't really get contact, you know, when you're in, as a clinician. So what is public health? What did the role entail? Yeah, so public health is, you know, the various def definitions, but the standard definition goes along the lines that it's the science and art of um, prolonging life uh, and uh, extending healthy life expectancy. So funnily enough, it comes back oh, wow. to what we were talking earlier about science and art. So that, yeah. that's the kind of formal definition. The way I describe it, if, you know, a member of the family say, what the hell is public health? I sort of say, well, we kind of deal... Um, every other branch of medicine, you're dealing with individuals, whereas mm -hmm. we... Are we are looking after populations and, and yeah. subpopulations within them. So our job really is, is to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. It's often about kind of policy type decisions. You know, what, what, what diseases should we screen for? What diseases should we not screen for? What um, drugs should we have available on our formulary? Which ones should we not have on the formulary? Uh, how should we organise healthcare services? Mm. Um, what mm. should we vaccinate against? How often should we vaccinate against them? So it's those kind of policy levels. And the specialty, you know, how radiology sort of splits into diagnostic radiology and interventional radiology. Public health is the same thing. You can split it mm -hmm. in various ways. But the main subdivision is into what's called communicable disease control versus general public health. So communicable disease control is about uh, biological, radiological and chemical threats to the population. And you look at them both proactively. So, you know, what's our policy for, for getting ready for, you know, these things, doing training, exercise and so on. So proactive stuff and reactive stuff so when an incident occur when an incident occurs then then um then zeroing in and, and, and containing it so that, that's one half the other half that is, is is what i did which was the the more general elements of public health and these days most public health 
um, specialists uh, because I, I say specialists because you don't have to be a doctor to be a specialist uh, in public health anymore. Um, but th they they generally now work under a director of population, sorry, a director of public health within a local authority, um, or mm. they work in weird and wonderful places uh, like the Department of Health, um, the World Health Organization, and, and so on. And, and it was that third kind of niche that mm. I went into. So when I finished my training, I ended up working in the think tank sector initially. Mm. Gareth, so with public health, right, how were you first exposed to it? Because a lot of people will know, as you said, about renal, gastro, cardiology, right? We only ever hear about public health through podcasts like this, right? So for someone who's listening right now and they said, you know what, I want, I want to go and expose myself, how would you say they go and do that? It's a really good question. So um, most universities, you know, you, you do some of the topics um as an undergraduate they tended mm. to be the things that you know induced the biggest yawning so epidemiology <laughs> and statistics and stuff with everything what the hell do you want to do that for but um <laughs> i often say it's a little bit like uh watching video games if you're watching someone else playing them it's really boring but if you're the person actually doing it it can be good fun um it's a really good question so it was a bit of a leap actually um i still remember my first day in public health um mm. kind of because like other branches of medicine where you're in a clinical environment here you're in an office environment and I still remember kind of I'd never stepped foot really in an open plan office before and <laughs> you had that kind of hum of the, the um the, the the photocopier machine and it just reminded me of the office comedy that like it was exactly that kind of same background music um so for me it was a, a novel thing to move into that world um these days if I understand things correctly it's a bit easier some training programs for FY, you know, foundation years will have a, a, a taster of um, public health. My yep. suggestion is probably if, if one of your friends did that, to have a, a chat with them and see whether there was any opportunity to shadow them. Um, but I think every, every day is, is so different in public health that if you're just there for a day or two, you, you might not get a full sense of it. And, and I come back to my point about playing computer games if you're just watching someone else doing it it's not that exciting but if you're the yeah. person in the meeting trying to steer policy or make decisions then that's why people get a buzz out of it yeah. amazing and talking and talking a little bit about it in a sense it's like a computer game right so you've trained in public health right and then covid comes along is this something that you could have ever imagined um talk to us a little bit about the experience of being in public health and then suddenly covid hitting us all what was it all like yeah yeah so it's a really good question i um you do prepare for these kinds of things it's a bit like the military you know it's kind of drilled into you and you do regular exercises this was yeah. actually my third major thing like this so um i was working in as a public health trainee when um the the, the swine flu um Thing erupted mm. and also if you remember the polonium poisoning where that um, that, that chap was was poisoned and um, yeah. I was involved very closely in both of those so i still remember with the polonium poisoning having to go out yeah. to sort of screen people that potentially had been um, exposed to it and taking urine samples from them uh, and then with the with the, the swine flu um being in the kind of control center where i mean it, it, it's literally like something from nasa where you've got kind of screens all around you um it was full on so there were camp beds where we were spending the night and food was being brought in for us and stuff so so I, i'd experienced that before and obviously mm. they're, they're pretty horrific things that you're dealing with but on the other side it is very exciting it's, it's what you've trained for um so in the same way that maybe an orthopedic surgeon gets excited by a trauma call it, it, it was that kind <laughs> of equivalent really for for public health. um when it came to the pandemic I wasn't working in a direct public health role, so I was working as, as chief data mm. officer, but I did get pulled in in, in two ways. One was um, I got pulled in to lead the development of the contact tracing app. Um, so for the first four months or so of the pandemic, um, I was mm. working literally every moment of the, of the working day. Um, uh, so, so that that was that was pretty full on, and then later on in the pandemic, um, there was an instruction given out to everybody in NHS England who had a clinical background to volunteer mm. to go back to the front line, and I you see. could either go and work in ITU um, or working in the vaccination centre. So I went down to the um, the, the Excel centre in East London to help with the vaccination effort. Oh wow! 
um, tell us a bit more, you know, we're trying to keep on tabs of all the different things you've done in your career, right? So tell us, you, you mentioned kind of the, the, the data, the, the chief data officer role. Um, tell us a bit more how you ended up in that role, yeah. um, what it entailed. And was that kind of before kind of the work around virtual wards or was that kind of in tight line with it? Because yeah. I want to kind of also the question is the mindset shift from clinician to kind of an exec position. Okay. And what driven you to do that? Yeah. So um, maybe if I go through it chronologically, that, that yeah, will help. Probably best. Yeah. Interject so I, I don't forget the kind of sub parts of your question. Um so I mentioned that um, I'd done that this kind of extra stint in A&E, decided to go and do public health. And the very first place I went to where I heard those photocopiers kind of uh, <laughs> roaring in the background was um, in what was called a primary care trust. They don't exist anymore, but they were the kind of local um, offices, if you like, of, of the NHS. And the one I got sent to was the primary care trust in Croydon in South London. Um, Basically, within two or three weeks, I got asked to get involved in a project, and that project has stayed with me throughout the rest of my life. Um, so the project oh, wow. was uh, that the Department of Health wanted to develop something called a predictive risk model, um, and it had um, procured New York University that had a lot of expertise in this field and a think tank called the King's Fund to build a predictive risk model. And, and what that model did was to look for patterns in population uh, data to, um, to try and forecast which individuals in that population were likely to have an unplanned hospital admission in the next 12 months, with the idea being that you would then focus preventive care on those people to try and prevent them from going into hospital. Because going into hospital as an emergency, as we all know, is uh, it can be very expensive and very unpleasant for the patient concerned. So that was the project that I got involved in. Um, they were looking, you know, if you're going to build one of these predictive models, you need a data set to do it on. And it just so happened that Croydon uh, Primary Care Trust had very good, rich data going a long way back in time. And, and, and the reason for that was Croydon was um, just the right size not to be reorganised. It was like Goldilocks, not too big and not too small. So it never mm. got reorganised. And as a result, it had longitudinal data going a long way back. So I got involved in that project. Um, the specific bit of the project I was asked to, to lead was to say, OK, well, we're, you know, in, in, in a few months time, we're going to have this new predictive model that's been built. And for the first time ever, we are going to know with a, a, a reasonable degree of accuracy which individuals in the population of Croydon are at high risk of having an unplanned hospital admission in the next 12 months. And the question I was asked to solve was, what do we do with those people? Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'd recently made the jump, as, as I said, from hospital medicine into working in the community. And one of the things that struck me about working in the community was that there were lots and lots of fantastic teams working away, you know, district physiotherapy, district nursing, community matrons, all these kinds of things. But it was all a little bit disjointed. And you compare that with a hospital where, you know, we can moan all day about the way hospitals run, but at least <laughs> we have the concept of being subdivided into wards and those mm. wards having a dedicated team that makes sure they see every patient on the ward you have these routines like a ward round and a board round and a drugs round and an obs round and so put simply we we said well couldn't we use the same systems and staffing and structure and daily routines of a hospital ward but apply them for people living in their own homes. Um, and the way we would select which patients got offered this virtual ward care was those people that came out as highest risk on this predictive risk model. So that's basically how the concept was, was born. Um, it took the pandemic, you know, was it 15 years later to really kick the thing off in a vengeance? Uh, and I think mm -hmm. it was the twin things of 
the, the, the added pressure to try and keep people out of hospital uh, because you didn't want them to contract COVID and the fact that technology had moved on was what why they kind of hit the sweet spot and why now everybody's talking about virtual wards. So when we were doing it, literally the only technology we had was a laptop <laughs> phone and an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, these days, you know, Teams has become ubiquitous. We've got electronic patient records. Yeah. We've got um, remote monitoring. Uh, people have got mobile phones, and and so the world has moved on. And and virtual wards have you know as people know have kind of taken off. But I think the key thing about virtual wards is to go back to the founding principles, which were that hospital wards are a good thing. That there is a reason yeah. why wards all over the world have been organised into. Uh, sorry, why hospitals all over the world have, world have been organised into wards. And it's those daily routines and practices that we, you know, we neglect at our peril. So um, that, that, that's how, mm. I, how I feel about that. Yeah. No, definitely. Talking about it, it seems like it was a norm, it was a given. Why on earth would you do it any different? But I imagine, you know, hindsight is a great thing, right? But I imagine, that, you know, when you're there, you know, yeah. over a decade no, you're or so, quite right. really... um, one of the things you've got to be careful with in, in public health, we're very big on evaluation. So we're really careful mm. to evaluate. And one of the issues with the type of virtual ward I described, which you might refer to as a predict and prevent virtual ward, we use a, a tool to predict who's going to go into hospital. Yes. We offer them a virtual ward to try and prevent a hospital admission. One of the issues with that is that it can uh, unearth problems that weren't known about so yeah. it can actually lead to kind of identifying unmet need and in many ways that's a brilliant thing because these patients you know you, you're helping them with it but if your goal is to try and reduce hospital admissions you may find that actually you achieve the opposite of what you set out <laughs> to achieve because you've found all these um the the the, the these these unmet needs of, of your patients. What mm. the NHS is now doing instead is what's referred to as step up and step down. So step down yeah. towards allowing patients to go home from hospital earlier than they would otherwise have done because um, they're, they're still being cared for on a virtual ward and step up being people that you're basically diverting. They're en route into a hospital bed, if you like, and you divert them. And that diversion can either happen in primary care mm. or in the ambulance trust uh, or in A&E or indeed by the specialist. So no. lots of innovation going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I do think it's an exciting time. I remember I was at work in like a, in the North London hospital and then we had this virtual ward consultant who was a very young chap, his background was respiratory. We could have figured out for the life of us how to onboard these patients. Where do they go? It's like a COPD patient's on the cusp of the target sat, but they like fitting while walking around. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, here's a good candidate. Here's a good candidate. We're going to onboard them. And it was mind blowing. <laughs> but I can kind of see the, the, the appeal around it. Yeah. Tell us what happened next? You know, you're working with this data, you're yeah. kind of exploring the idea of virtual wards. Yeah. What came yeah. next for you? So we did that. Um, I then, um, I, I did two years at Croydon. Um, as part of my training, I had to do a, a master's in public health. Um, uh, so did that and then basically finished my training. So I did a, a bit of communicable disease control and I talked about a couple of incidents uh, there. I then actually moved to the cabinet office um, where they'd heard about this project with virtual wards and, and predictive models and were interested in other applications for it. So I did a stint there. And then I was fortunate enough to get a fellowship to go to New York University. So um, it's something called the Commonwealth Fund uh, offer these scholarships. Um, and I went and, and spent a year studying the future of, of, of predictive modeling. Um, came back, did a stint in a couple of, of think tanks, um, and then finished my training and got a consultant level post in a small think tank called the Nuffield Trust. Um, so I worked there and it's kind of on the margins of academia, really. It's a, it's a very interesting place um, to work in a think tank because it's sort of it, it, you do bits of research, but a lot of what you're trying to do is to influence policy. Mm, um, yeah. And so spent um, a, a ha happy, you know, two or three years working there. Um, and then I got contacted out of the blue by somebody that I'd met when I was in New York, who just got a new job in Chicago and um, was setting up a team and said, did I fancy going to work for him? And so, <laughs> you know, I was young and single at the time. I thought, right, why not? So moved out to, um, moved out to uh, Chicago to work for a company called Walgreens, uh, which is the parent company for Boots, the chemist. Um, oh, wow. And it was a very interesting time to be in America because President Obama had um, just been elected and 
was bringing through his healthcare reforms, one of which was to establish what are called accountable care organisations, which have certain similarities to the integrated care systems we've now got in England. Um, and so I worked in Chicago out there and um, helped uh, establish a chain of accountable care organisations right across the state. So spent quite a lot of the time flying back and forth, which was a very interesting uh, experience. Um, really enjoyed my time, learned a huge amount of about how the retail sector uses data in different ways from healthcare. Um, but what was going on back in the UK was that um, the health service was being completely reorganised as part of Andrew Lansley's reforms. And a new entity called NHS England, or at the time it was called the, the NHS Commissioning Board, was established and was advertising for jobs. And somebody sent me the advert <laughs> the role of Chief Data Officer in the Sunday oh, Times. Wow. And so I stuck in my, my application for it and had an interview from a hotel room in Atlanta. I still remember it. <laughs> Um, but got offered the job. So um, much as I actually would have been happy to spend a lot longer in Chicago because I was really enjoying myself, this was an opportunity uh, too great to miss. So um, came back to the UK and then took on the role of Chief Data Officer um, back in, I think it was January 2013, if I remember rightly. So yeah, and then did that role for nine years before moving across to Microsoft. I've got two questions for you, Garen. One is a step back. So talking a little bit about, about virtual wards before we quickly move on. Um, the question of yep. when you open up um, innovations, open it, it can also open up a can of worms, like we see with AI, right? So I'm talking about when we're on the shop front, right? Is there a danger of patients being funneled into virtual wards because of the pressures within hospitals? Because that's the only space that we've got. And is that, in fact, actually more dangerous than them? Like, like we see sometimes patients in hospital corridors just because we have no space. Um, what's your opinion on that? Because I work in an A&E department and during winter pressures, they are in the corridors sometimes. Um, and I'm just thinking if we were to have virtual wars that we could stream them into, do we face dangers of, I don't know, strategists and the people up top saying, put them there instead for now? Um, what do you think about that? Does it yeah. happen? Can it happen? I've not heard of it, but... Um... And I've not actually heard anyone raise it as a concern before, but it's certainly a valid concern and something we should be really careful about. Mm. Um, whenever you're starting a new project, um, one of the key things to get in place is what's called the governance. Uh, it sounds like a very boring, dry term, but governance <laughs> is about how do you govern, how do you manage, how do you run it? And there are various elements to governance. Um, there's the kind of overarching governance structure. So who's in charge? Um, mm. What are their reports? lines, um, having a very clear kind of mission statement, all these really boring things. But if you don't have them, then you'll miss them later on. So getting that right. And then yeah. there are two other specific forms of governance that are critically important. One is called information governance. And um, often people kind of roll their eyes when you say information <laughs> governance or IG. Um, I actually used to manage the information governance team in NHS England, and I know they have a very bad rap. In fact, they will be your very best friends. If you get information governance involved right at the start of a project mm. and treat them as if they're a member of the multidisciplinary team, their role is to help you succeed and to make sure that you comply with the law and, um, and all the requirements on you. So information governance yep. is, is one specialist area. And then the other one is clinical governance. So what mm. are the clinical safety elements? What are the risks involved? So my mm. strong advice you know, for any project like a virtual world, anything else, is to get that governance in place to safeguard against some of the things that you're worried about. Yeah. One other thing that's worth mentioning is that um, you know one of the features of being on a hospital ward is that there are lots of people around you, other patients, families, mm. nursing staff, healthcare assistants, doctors, physios, wandering around. And if all of a sudden you kind of turn grey and start to look, look a bit unwell, there is that safety net of lots of other people noticing it and being able to shout for yeah. help. You don't get that in a virtual ward, and therefore you need to overcompensate for it. And therefore, for example, you, you, you might want to monitor people more closely than you would on a hospital ward because mm. there's nobody sort of casting an eye on you in the meantime. The other thing that um, we're starting to see is um, companies that are developing algorithms to study the data that are generated by these things 
mm. in order to see if you can pick up early warning signs of deterioration. Um, and so I think that's going to be an area to, to watch when it comes to virtual wards is that kind of, as I said, slightly over observing patients that, uh, in order to overcompensate for the fact that there are people yep. around. And then secondly, to analyze those data really carefully to see if we can pick up early warning signs. There's always a danger with these things of what are called false positive and false negative results. And so that comes back to the governance element that I mentioned earlier. Yep. So you've got to think of everything in the round. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And my second question is more focused on you. Now, throughout your journey so far, right, you've said, oh, I got a call from someone. I was asked to give my specialty opinion <laughs> and so on and so forth, right? Me and Abdul are very uh, strong advocates of clinicians, doctors, people who have talents, who have special talents to be visible for these opportunities. If you now reflect on yourself, what is it that you've done to become visible that when an opportunity um, arises, someone says, ah, let's give Garen a call. What is it that you've done? Is it that you're online? Is it that you've told a lot of people about your interests? Can you just reflect and tell us a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, the first point is actually that um, my career does never had a master plan to it. It was still just <laughs> things just drifted, and it was you know there's the term serendipity. So that that's how mm. it felt. It, you know, an opportunity would come up, and I thought, to hell with it. Let's go and let's. So so yeah, seizing the opportunities that come to you, I think, is the first point. Mm. But uh, to answer your question, I actually think I did the opposite of what you. Do. So I, I don't make a thing of, you know, pushing myself forward. I tend to be a bit yeah. more reserved and, and sometimes people respond better to that. Um, mm. What I try to do is to be nice to everyone. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> if they're thinking of somebody to ask, they know I'm going to, you know, try and be nice and try and be helpful to them. Yep. But also, um, I always try to put myself in their shoes. So, you know, you mm. often go to events where people are busy networking and they'll come up and they'll try to get my attention. What they often do wrong is to put my, they, they forget to put themselves in my shoes. So what can they do to help me? And I think that's the bit of advice I would give is, is always put yourself in the shoes of the person that, um, that, yeah. that you're trying to get help from. Mm. So two way process. Yeah. No, absolutely. Def definitely. Um, going back to the four opportunities, tell us about this exec, this chief role, what it entailed. I know you know it was involved in GDPR governance, and you did that for a while. <laughs> tell us what the day to day was like. And uh, the question I want to ask is: You initially said early on that you never really found that one special, that one career which gelled with you. As you were going down this journey, did you feel you were starting to find your passion, your calling? and you felt more fulfilled in the stuff you were doing? Yeah, brilliant question. So came back from, uh, as I said, that online interview in Atlanta. I still remember I had I think I had a shirt and tie on the top and pyjama bottoms. <laughs> um, but uh, in, in all seriousness, came back to, to the UK um, to take on the role. And it was a very, very strange time. So the NHS commissioning board, as it was called, it later got rebranded as NHS England, was by some accounts the world's largest startup. So it went from a budget of zero to a budget of 100 billion practically overnight. <laughs> and it was quite a chaotic time, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, the systems and structures of a, a large organisation just weren't there, which kind of made it exciting, but also slightly chaotic. So I didn't have a team when I started. So my first job was mm. to start recruiting and we didn't have the systems mm. in place. to. So it, it was a quite, quite a challenging time. Um, basically, I ended up um, recruiting three teams, one looking after information governance, uh, one looking after what are called information standards, and a third team looking after information strategy. So a lot of my role was in involved in nurturing those teams, helping them get a clear path of what they were trying to achieve, trying to instill a culture in them of you know being helpful, putting themselves in the shoes mm. of the local NHS, um, painting an exciting vision for them. So got involved in, in, in that. Um, then, um, so you were asking what, what did day 
day-to-day life involve? Um, initially, it was um, quite a nomadic life, actually, because <laughs> um, the NHS headquarters had officially moved to Leeds. So oh, wow. as a team, we all used to spend Monday and Tuesday in London because that's where the ministers were and, and a lot of other organisations were. Then we'd all decamp up to Leeds for Wednesday and Thursday and then back down to wherever we were to work from home on a Friday. So that's what that was like. A lot of time was spent in meetings. Um, I both kind of one-to-one meetings with the people that I line managed um, and the people who were line managing me. Um, One-to-one meetings with the different stakeholders. When you're in a large organization like NHS England, it's really important that you've got branches out to other directorates. So a lot of time spent in that. Um, Team meetings, sort of inspiring the team, keeping their morale up and, you know, trying to paint a picture of where we're heading. But then a lot of time spent in board meetings, which I'd never really experienced before that point. So learning how they work, um, you know, having the papers coming through beforehand, um, the, the meeting itself, that that was a new thing for me. And, and a large amount of my time was spent doing it. Um, a few years into the my my time at NHS England, um, I got sent on a training course alongside all of my peers, um, to what was called the Major Project Leadership Academy, where hmm. you were effectively taught how to run multi-million pound projects. Um, and so that was an absolutely fascinating thing. I was training alongside people from all walks of life. So there were a couple of submarine captains and oh, wow. people oh, wow. that were building HS2 uh, in, in that team. So I learned a huge amount from that the main message being that you you should treat a major project like the the kind of project i got involved in as if they were a temporary organization so thinking again of you know what the, what's the staffing model how how do you yeah. create the structures for it to operate successfully so did that and then from time to time i would get pulled in to work in specific projects just because of my slightly eclectic background so um, i got pulled <laughs> into something called the um what was it called? The Vanguards program, uh, where we were looking at new models of care for the NHS. Um, so uh, helped run the population health stream of, of that, um, uh, which ultimately led to the creation of these integrated care systems that are about to celebrate their first birthday next month. Um, and then, as I mentioned, during the pandemic, got pulled to work on, on, on yeah. things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the second question was, while doing all of this, how are you feeling as an individual? Did you feel fulfilled? Were you content with the way the career had taken shape? Mm. I was certainly, yes, I think I was much happier in these roles than I would have been in clinical medicine. I found clinical medicine quite yeah. relentless. Um, I'm somebody that doesn't respond well to lack of sleep, so I'm still haunted by the sound of the bleep going off <laughs> two in the morning. Oh, me too, don't I? Oh, I'm worried it doesn't go off. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've realized that I really enjoy working in a tightly knit team. So you, I do mm-hmm. miss, you know, when, when I started my training, we still worked in, in what were called firms of a consultant registrar, SHA, okay, yeah. doctors, and, and that feeling was great. So in other elements of my career where I've had that really tight team feeling, I've been really happy. And then I guess my, I've worked out that my happy place is actually standing around a whiteboard. It might sound a bit sad, <laughs> Being, you know, with a really challenging problem that we need to solve and having two or three other colleagues nicking the pen off each other and scribbling yeah. ideas, and that's where I'm at my <laughs> No, definitely. Um, you, you, you'd be surprised to know behind Ams, and I can't see it on camera, we've got a whiteboard of our own as well. <laughs> and I think it's just the best way for... Uh, you know, for someone that's, you know, building a tech platform and all of that stuff, like pen and paper, old school is the way to go for me. I don't know how you are. Yeah, but... I agree with you. I, I think working remotely is absolutely fine, but yeah. I've not, nobody's quite cracked the equivalent of a whiteboard where everyone can just sort of join the pen. I know there are solutions it, out there, but they're not quite yeah. the same, are they? No, yeah. it doesn't. <laughs> the, the, the other question I had before kind of moving on was, what is it that, you would like to kind of tell clinicians, the people at the front line, when it comes to data, when it comes to kind of these policy making roles that they don't see, because there is this divide, Uh, you know, the people at the the top end management don't listen to us. You know, what is it that you want to kind of convey or the the barriers and the difficulties of your job, right? Because I imagine doing this, doing that, or connecting all the data in NHS, having one system is a lot difficult than it sounds. 
if you kind of understand the gist of the question. Yeah, I mean, it's if, there's no easy answers. If there were easy answers, yeah. you would have thought of them. Um, so, you know, take what I say with a pinch of salt and it, these may not all be possible, but there are certain things you could do. So one is actually to train in clinical informatics. There's the faculty of clin- clinical informatics. And we're a bit snob- snobbish in, in medicine, <laughs> aren't we, that we kind of respect people who've got letters after their name. So get, getting your membership of... Um, the faculty of clinical informatics certainly can help um, getting, a, a, and that's not the only, only qualification, you know, the British Computing Society will have qualifications, Get maybe getting a qualification in public health to show that you're able to take a step back and think, you know, at a system level can help. So that, that would be one approach. Um, another tack would be to try and get involved. Um, so are there are there projects that you can get involved with? I, I mentioned that there was a project that I got involved with and it sort of stayed with my career throughout. So getting involved in a project, making friends with some of the decision makers with the IT department. Um, another uh, approach is to sort of find a champion um, that, that, you know, that's quite high up in, 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 in management. So m- most trusts now should have what's called a, a chief clinical information officer or CCIO. Mm. So finding out who your CCIO is, meeting them, coming back to what I was saying earlier, what can you do to make your CCIO's life easier? Put yourself in their yeah. shoes and, and see how you can help. Um, and then one other thing that's relatively new, but I think is quite exciting, is the concept of low code, no code. I don't know if you've come across this. Yeah. So it, it, it's enabling people uh, like me who don't have much coding experience at all to actually do things and develop apps and websites mm. and so on. Um, so have a look at low code, no code. Um, quick plug for Microsoft. We've got a platform called the Power Platform, which does that. But lo- there are lots of other examples as well. No, definitely. Amazing. So tell us about kind of where you are now, you know, the, the transition into Microsoft. I'm curious to know, was it a phone call? Was it a message? Did you get reached out to? Did you apply? You know, tell us a bit more about that thing. Yeah, it was actually a tweet, actually. Oh, <laughs> so, man. Yeah. I missed it. So, uh, I mentioned that I spent some time working in the cabinet office. Um, one of my colleagues who was in the cabinet office, very similar story, actually, to what happened in Chicago. So he moved to Microsoft, was building a team, put a tweet out. I sent him a text message, had a conversation, and then that led into the interview process. So that, that's how I, I, I got the role. Oh, wow. um, so the role that I do um, is I, I'm one of several what I call industry advisors. Um, so mm-hmm. Microsoft is reorganizing itself over the course of seven, several years away from being organized horizontally to being organized vertically. And what I mean by that is that in the past, you might have had a team that looked after hardware and another one that looked after the operating system, another one after software, another after cloud. We turned that through 90 degrees and sliced it up into different sectors of the economy, different verticals as they're referred mm. to. So there's an entirely vertically integrated team within Microsoft that looks after, for example, uh, the transport sector or defense or financial services. There's another one for health and life sciences, and I sit within that team. I'm one of three industry advisors, and our role really is to help increase the um, expertise in relation to how the NHS works within Microsoft. And I sometimes say that my job is a bit of a translation in, in two directions. So I kind of translate what's going on in the NHS and explain that to my colleagues in Microsoft. And then I translate in the opposite direction by speaking to people working in the NHS who've got a particular challenge and to say, well, did you know that Microsoft might be able to help you using the following technology? So that that's kind of what my, my job is all about. Hmm. Um, it was, what was it like moving to Microsoft? It was yeah. odd moving during the middle of a pandemic. So when I, when I moved here, we were still under kind of lockdown type uh, restrictions, all the offices were closed. So coming into a new job where you're working from home and everyone's working from yeah. home, your laptop gets couriered to you was quite an experience. Um, but I think the overarching thing that I noticed was just how civilised a place it is to work. So we all mm-hmm. know because of the pressures in the NHS, it can be quite a fractious 
argumentative place sometimes. Um, there's none of that in Microsoft. It's a very nice, friendly, gentle place to work, um, yeah. which I, I, I really appreciate. It's a very professional place to work. Yeah. The kind of mandatory training that we have to do is, is you know, is, is done to a very, very high spec. It's almost like kind of TV standards of, of the kind yeah. of training. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's really interesting. Um, I find it really interesting working in a multinational organization. So I work quite closely with my counterpart in Australia and in Canada and, 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 and having those relationships is interesting. Mm-hmm. Working in a company that also faces out to all these other sectors of the economy is helpful because there's often, you know, concepts that are used in, in one part of the economy that hasn't moved into the NHS yet and you can borrow ideas. So I, I, I like doing that. Um, what else was I going to say? I, I guess the only other thing that's happened is that there's been a massive acceleration in innovation. So you'll yeah. all be with chat gpt and open ai and many of my colleagues in microsoft have been working here for literally for decades and they say that they've never known anything like such a rapid pace yeah. of innovation. um sometimes microsoft has a bit of a bad reputation for being relatively slow moving sometimes oh with some of this but that's definitely not the case with no. open AI. we're really kind of motoring ahead and you, you'll 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 have read about a lot of this in the press yeah. of course yeah so so it's quite an exciting no place to work and to but, think through both the safeguards that would need to be in place. Microsoft is very, very conscious of its moral and, and ethical duties, particularly when it comes to AI. We have something called the uh, Responsible AI Framework that's been in place for many years. So adapting that uh, is really important, but also you know, seizing the opportunities. How is this going to help the NHS face its challenges? So it, it's yeah. a really interesting time to be mm. here. Garrett, when talk when working at a big tech company, right? I often tell colleagues, "Did you know Google Health is a thing? Microsoft is a thing? They're all involved in the healthcare system." Then you said you put it quite nicely when you said we translate what's going on in the NHS to other colleagues. Um, are you able to give some sort yeah. of example for the people listening in now and thinking, "Okay, that's interesting." So I want to know a little bit more. Any examples? Yeah, I mean, I guess Microsoft is most famous. Most of your you know, listeners and, and viewers will know Microsoft because of things like Windows and yeah. Word, Excel, <laughs> Teams, PowerPoint. Um, so we do that kind of thing, but we also do um, large kind of innovative projects. So, for example, using artificial intelligence, hospital up in Northumberland has been using it to try and optimise um, the, the, the kind of waiting list for patients waiting for surgery and make sure that they go to the right site within the trust and that kind of thing. So so they're, mm. they're, they're those elements. The other thing which I hadn't appreciated before coming to Microsoft was just how important our partner network network is so a partner would be another company that uses microsoft technology so for example mm. I, I work in population health um, one of our partners is called graphnet um, they mm. are a company and all of their t- technology is kind of based on microsoft because of that mm. microsoft you know wants to really nurture graphnet and so some of my time is spent with graphnet i just use that as one example there are, there are dozens of yeah. them and so so working with partners is something that I, I hadn't quite appreciated so it's um so that that's another element um and then i guess my day to day you know you, you were saying what kind of things do i do so um I, I i try to go out to the front line whenever i can um i spent i was up in leicester yesterday learning about their different um virtual wards so i'll take those messages back to microsoft to see how our technology can can help them with the challenges that they're facing yeah no, definitely. The, I think one of the last questions is, what has the response been like? Because, you know, the NHS is a kind of a government body, a government run institution per se, and then big tech, you know, profit driven companies, large, you know, corporations. Is it well received when you are going into these hospitals, working with these partners? Or is it like, wait a minute, you know, they're coming to take over, things are going to change? What has that environment been like? Um, it's a good question. I've not really faced that. I think Microsoft, you know, ev- everyone knows that it would be nonsensical for the NHS to develop its own email client or yeah, its yeah, own yeah. word processing software. So everyone's comfortable with, with the use of Microsoft. 
Um, I think we've got a reputation for being trustworthy. Um, we've yeah, got yeah. a long-standing partnership yeah. with the NHS. Um, and so I don't really get that sense of, 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 of mistrust, I, I have to say. I'm, um, I think maybe it helps because I'm a doctor and I've spent so long in yeah. my career. I'm still regarded as, as, as one of the team, as it were. But I think that that's the case for all of my colleagues in Microsoft. It, it's not really been a challenge. Yes, yes. And the last question to kind of wrap up is, you know, have you looked into kind of the next phase of your career journey? What would you like to get involved in? Or, you know, what are you most excited about the future of kind of healthcare and what you're doing? Yeah, no. Um, so it kind of comes back to my earlier answer that, you know, I, I just wait for new opportunities to arise. Yeah. One of the great things about Microsoft is there is a very large organization and has, you know, kind of career trajectories within it so i'm very happy where i am uh in addition awesome. though, I, I enjoy you know helping some of these smaller companies there are a couple of, of, of companies that i've met through our partner network that are doing some really exciting things um and and so helping them to grow uh I, i'm privileged to be able to do that within the construct of working for microsoft but th i think that is a really exciting thing um it, it is seeing startups and it, I, I can completely understand why people get addicted to working in startups yeah that's how exciting <laughs> they are yeah no definitely um grant i want to thank you for taking the time out you know you had a whirlwind of a career so many different phases so many lessons to be learned and i think seizing the opportunity no matter where it takes in the world is, is something i'm taking back from this um and it was an absolute pleasure to kind of chat to you and finally hear your story. Thank you. No, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been quite therapeutic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's always a nice thing to kind of reflect back on the journey. Thank you so much, Karan.